Okay, all kinds of fun stuff. Romans chapter 15, verses 25 through 33, when reality doesn't meet expectations. Uh, this is going to be Paul's closing statement. After this, we've got one more chapter, chapter 16. But in this uh, closing statement, Paul is going to outline uh, sort of what his expectations are for the future, how Paul sees the future rolling out for himself. And of course, he is saying, if it's God's will. But I thought, what an appropriate text. If we can understand what Paul was going through, what Paul was expecting, and then take a look at what actually happened to Paul, I think that's going to be an encouragement to all of us as to where our hope needs to lie, even when life isn't turning out the way we planned. So let's read, starting in verse 25. At the present, Paul is saying, at the present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor amongst the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. And when therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them the collection, I will leave for Spain by way of you. Now I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. And I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Verse 31, that I can be, and watch for three things here, that I can be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, that my service for Jerusalem will be acceptable to the saints, and so that by God's will I can come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. I want you to put a square around that word refreshed. Uh, we're going to look at that. I want to be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. I want us to look at this section of text and to look at what Paul's expectations are, how Paul saw the future unrolling for himself. In this case, uh, Paul is specifically involved in the ministry, specifically saying, I'm in, I'm in the service of God to Jerusalem and so he's about God's business. And this is going to serve as a reminder that being a child of God doesn't guarantee us uh, comfort and peace in this life. So we'll watch for how Paul's life rolls out. What Paul has just outlined in his prayer, uh, he's taken up a contribution throughout uh, Macedonia to take money back to Jerusalem. There must have been an extreme poverty, uh, possibly even a famine happening in Jerusalem. So Paul is taking money back to the saints and he's really looking forward. Can you imagine yourself having to make a long trip, looking forward to getting back home because you're bringing finances for people that desperately need it. Think of it as hurricane relief or something along that nature. So Paul must be excited about taking this gift back to Jerusalem. He says, uh, after I'm done in Jerusalem, uh, I want to come see you guys that are in Spain, and I want you guys to be praying for me. Paul tells the Roman church, I want you to be praying for me, and I want you to pray for three things. Pray that I won't be delivered into the hands of unbelievers. Pray that my service, the contribution that I'm bringing to the church will be acceptable that everybody will receive me well. And then thirdly, and this is the one that I'm going to kind of focus in on. After that, I hope I can come to you guys and rest. That's really what the word is. You should put a word around whatever your translation has there. Um, I believe the ESV has refreshed. But I want us to look at that word. So those are Paul's plan. That's how he's hoping things are going to go. Let's look at the first uh, verse here, verse 32. 
so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed. Sun anapao, sun anapao. That, that, that gets translated in your Bible as refreshed or relax. Uh, it's a compound word, so I just want to draw a little bit of attention to it. Pao means literally, that's the word that gets translated to rest or be refreshed. Pao by itself in the Greek means to stop, literally. But when they say it in, in the way Paul is saying it, anapao, it means I, I want to stop, I want to cease from my work. I want to be able to come to you guys and I want to be able to relax. I want to be able to let my hair down. A little bit of r and R. I'm looking forward to, Paul obviously has been through some stressful situations in his ministry. And very specifically, Paul is saying, I hope when I get done with all this hard stuff, I hope that I get to come to you and just rest and just have a break. That's what this word anapao means. Uh, let me show you a couple places where it's used. Matthew chapter 11, uh, Jesus promised rest for the weary. And this is the word he used. Come to me, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you anapao. I'll give you rest. I'll give you comfort. Uh, he uses it again for his apostles when they are in the garden of Gethsemane with Jesus on his last night before crucifixion. Do you remember they were all tired and they were all wanting to sleep? And Jesus would go away and pray and he would come back and find them all sleeping. So Matthew 26 and verse 45, he says, He came to the disciples and said to them, uh, Sleep and take your rest on a pao later on. Don't be taking a break right now, he says. Do that later on. The hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. And so I look at that word as Paul saying, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to being done and being able to stop and take a break and rest with you guys when I finally get to Rome. Paul has got quite a bit of work left. He's in Corinth when he writes the letter of Romans to Rome. And from Corinth, he's got to return all the way back to Jerusalem, give the gift and face whatever is going to happen in Jerusalem. But he says, when I get done with all the hard, stressful stuff that I'm involved in, I can't wait to come see you guys and to rest. The compound there, the soon, anapao means to stop, to rest, to cease from your work. Uh, but there is a soon, the S-U-N there at the bottom. When you add that to the word, it means together with. I want you to kind of remember that S-U-N, soon, at the beginning of a word, takes whatever the word is, in this case rest, and when you add soon to the beginning of it, you make a compound. It means together, I want to do this together with you guys. That's the mode and the mood of the letter. Paul has got expectations. But I want you to listen closely to Paul's story. We're going to trace uh, what Paul's life kind of looked like up to this point. And then we're going to see at what point Paul writes to Rome and says, I'm looking forward to resting with you guys. So I want to trace that story. Paul is going to talk about going to Rome. We're going to go to Acts, if you want to be turning there, Acts chapter 16. And we're going to kind of follow Paul's story. It's not until about Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 20 and verse 2. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 2, Paul is going to be in Greece at Corinth. He stays there for three months before he takes the money to Jerusalem. And you can make a note in your Bible if you like. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 2 is exactly the moment when Paul is writing the letter to Rome while he's in Greece for three months. So we're going to start before that point and look at what Paul's ministry, what kind of stress Paul might have been exposed to. So we're going to start before that back in Acts chapter 16,
in verse 22. Uh, Acts chapter 16 is when Paul converted Lydia. Paul found some women worshiping at a river. Uh, Paul also casts a demon out of a girl, a demon-possessed girl. But the problem with that is some men had been making money off of her because being demon-possessed, she could predict the future for people. She was fortune-telling, and people were paying big money for her to do that. So that exists. That's a real thing. But Paul cast the demon out of her, and when he did that, these men that were making money realized they just lost their bread and butter. They just lost their form of income. And so what happens in Acts 16 and verse 22... The crowd joined in attacking Paul and the magistrates, they tore their garments off and they they tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison. It's in prison where Paul is afflicted, have been beaten. And he says that uh, it's in prison where he's praying to God and singing songs to God, and he converts the Philippian jailer while he's there. Now, Philippi is way up at the top of Macedonia, and Paul in his missionary journey is going to work his way down Macedonia, but everywhere he goes, we're going to see that beatings and imprisonment was exactly what he was going to get. So from Philippi, Paul has to leave there when he gets out of jail. He leaves Philippi, goes down to Thessalonica. That puts us in Acts chapter 17. We're going to pick up in verse 3. Acts 17 and verse 3. Uh, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas, as did many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city into an uproar, and they attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out in a crowd. Paul just has escaped from jail, goes down to Thessalonica, and what's the first thing he starts doing again? Preaching the resurrection of Jesus all over again. The Jews get angry, they form a mob, and they attack the house where they expected Paul to be staying. Paul has to leave Thessalonica, so he travels down and he goes to Berea. We'll pick up that story in Acts 17 and verse 12. Paul leaves there, goes down to Berea, and it says in verse 12, Many of those therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too to agitate and to stir up the crowds. And the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. I hope you're getting a taste of what Paul's life was like. Compelled to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the same way that the church has been uh, commanded to do in Matthew, go and baptize all the nations and teach them to obey everything I've told you that I've commanded you. Paul was doing that, and we can see every time he opens his mouth for Jesus, persecution is what he has to go through. Beatings, imprisonments, a mob gathering together against you. We're going to fast forward a little bit in Paul's travels. Uh, in the meantime, there's been more riots. There's been more beatings along the different places that Paul goes to. And it's about this time we come to Acts chapter 19 and verse 21. Acts chapter 19, Paul is starting to see his ministry wrapping up. And he's going to express what he would like to do in the future. Acts chapter 19 and verse 21. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Acacia. If you remember what we read in our Romans passage uh, the contributions for Jerusalem come from Macedonia and Acacia. So Paul dissolved to pass through there 
and to go to Jerusalem and saying, after I've been there, I'd like to go see Rome. Now, it's in Acts chapter 20 that Paul sits down from Corinth and actually writes the letter to Rome. So I want to go back to Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 15 and verse 30. And let's just remember the prayer after all that Paul has been through. Paul asks the church to pray for me because I've kind of got my idea of how I would like the future to work out. Romans 15 and verse 30, Strive with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I can be, number one, delivered from the unbelievers. Number two, that my service to the Jerusalem saints will be acceptable. And number three, that by God's will I can come to you with joy and to be refreshed, to take a break, to get a little bit of rest, R&R, &R. I want to be able to let my hair down for a little while. That's what I'm looking forward to, Paul says. Can you relate to that? I, I guess with, with the, the seasons that we've just went through, uh, many of you are probably glad that it's over and go, I can't wait to rest. I'm done with all the cooking. I'm done with all the cleaning. I'm done with all the arrangements and the entertainments and being the host and the travel and the sleeping arrangements. I'm done with all that. I can't wait to get a little bit of rest, putting away the decorations and all of that. Some of you may have felt that, but I, I feel almost ashamed that that's that's the kind of rest that we're seeking. I can't really talk too much about spiritual persecution that we see going on. But that's what Paul was going through. Paul was suffering. Paul was wanting rest because every time he spoke about Jesus to the community, he ended up getting attacked. He ended up having violence pushed onto him. He ended up in mobs. getting beaten, getting arrested, and on the run. Because of his testimony for Jesus Christ, because of his witnessing of the truth. I think that's a wake-up call to us. You know, sometimes, do you ever have an opportunity to speak about the truth? Because you hear someone saying something that you know is a, a, a lie from Satan. You hear someone saying something that you know is a deception. You hear someone uh, talking about an ideology that you know God says is an abomination and we're exposed to what the world thinks. But do we ever speak up to the world the way Paul does? We're probably very timid because most of us probably realize that things can get pretty heated. You've probably experienced some of this from your own family members. And when you talk about Christ, it can get pretty heated. When you talk about church or your faith or the Bible, that people can get despondent. Maybe you experience it at work, but we all know that the potential is there. Paul is going to arrive in Jerusalem now. He's just said, I, I hope that I'm, I'm at the end of all of this difficult, stressful emotional turmoil that I've been going through for years now. I'm at the last leg. I'm, I'm headed back to Jerusalem, and I hope when I am done there, I just want to come rest with you guys. I hope that's how it works out. Well, I, I want to show you how it actually works out for Paul. Let's see what actually happens when Paul gets to Jerusalem. Acts chapter 21 We'll start in verse 27. Up to this point, Paul gets to Jerusalem. He's being real careful to try to keep the peace and keep things going smoothly in Jerusalem. So the first thing he does is he takes a vow and he purifies himself for seven days before he goes to enter into the temple. That was what was prescribed. That's what he had to do. So Paul was following the expectations of the people. <coughs> He purified himself for seven days. Now you'll remember 
that when he was moving throughout Macedonia, as he kept going further and further south, Philippi to Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, as he kept going south, people would chase Paul from one city, finding out that he had gone to another city. They would chase him down to that city to persecute him there. And when he left there, they would chase him down to the next city to persecute him there. I want you to notice that the same thing is happening even when he gets to Jerusalem, somebody is still chasing after Paul. Acts 21 and verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia saw him in the temple and stirred up the whole crowd and they laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and he was defiled the holy place. That was a lie. He didn't do that. Verse 30, Then all the city was stirred up. The people ran together. They seized Paul. They dragged him out of the temple and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohorts, that's the Roman soldiers, that all of Jerusalem was in an uproar. The Romans had to come put Paul in chains to get him out of the mob that he was engaged in. And the next thing we know, Paul is being strung out that means he's being stretched out to be flogged by the Roman soldiers. Flogging would have laid his back open. Blood would have been running down his back as his flesh was torn open. That's where Paul is at. And just a few weeks earlier, what was Paul hoping for? Pray that it'll go smooth in Jerusalem and that I get to finally come to Rome and rest. And Paul finds himself stretched out, about to be flogged by a Roman soldier. Fortunately for Paul, he tells the Roman soldier, is it okay to flog a Roman citizen? Paul was a Roman citizen. And when the soldier found out about that, he didn't flog Paul. So he takes Paul down and then they hold court. And Paul has to go to court against the Jewish people who are fabricating lies against himself. Have you ever felt like you were just caught up in a very unjust situation? Maybe with the holidays, maybe you, you could relate to family members or something, but you just find yourself going, you know, I just want to have fun. I just want to enjoy my family. I just want to have a little peace and rest. And I just want the holidays to be something beautiful. But for whatever reason, there's just difficulties, animosities. There's just dynamics within families that just, like Paul, you're just longing for something nice and beautiful and you don't get it. When reality doesn't meet up with your expectations. That's the lesson that I hope we can take away from Paul's difficult, difficult life. If we move forward, Paul is going to sit in jail for two years in Caesarea. There, it's not far from uh, Jerusalem. He's going to sit in jail for the next two years. That's quite a long layover, isn't it? And I can only imagine that those two years Paul is sitting in jail, he's talking to God and he's going, No, no, I specifically asked that I not be turned over to the unbelievers. I specifically asked for that. And what did I get? I'm sitting here in jail because I've been turned over to the non-believers. After two years, Paul uh, finally goes through a series of events and he is sent to Rome to be tried by a court in Rome. So he gets to Rome. It's just not the way that he had hoped that he would get there. I wanted us to reflect on Paul's story about our own faith, trying to live out our own righteousness 
in our jobs, in our families, in our communities, trying to live out our own righteousness and trying to testify to the truth of the gospel, to the truth of biblical things, to the truth of the things that God loves and the things that God hates, as we try to live that out. There may be some uncomfortable moments in that, and I hope we draw from Paul's experience. We've talked about suffering from your own family members. Some of you may have come into the church by having to leave another church, a different faith. And you know that that brings up problems. If you haven't already done so, I suggest that you read Mom's book. Uh, the uh, visitation card, My Life with God, because she tells full of stories what it was like to come out of Catholicism. The persecution and the hurt that you endure, even an old, your own family member says, from now on, you're dead to me. Some of you may have even experienced something like that coming from a different faith. I know of a uh, lady that uh, mom studied with and she accepted the gospel. She accepted her new faith, but in leaving her old faith, her husband got so angry that he divorced her. There can be pains that come along with embracing the truth of the gospel can happen at our jobs when all the guys are going out for their three martini lunches. And these are the guys that you kind of have to be friendly with if you ever want to get a promotion. There's all kinds of things about our faith and our Christianity that can bring on suffering and discouragement on us. And it can be devastating when reality doesn't meet the expectations that we had. Some people have even had a crisis of faith, a crisis of faith when something goes wrong. Maybe uh, uh, someone dies and the person can't deal. Someone gets a, a horrible disease and somebody else can't deal with the hurt that that brings into the relationship. How could God let something like that happen? A crisis of faith when our reality doesn't meet the kind of expectations we had about our future. Very difficult things that happen. I hope we'll use Paul's story to remain encouraged through those teams, those times. Let me start with some of the encouragement. Uh, Paul already had things worked out for himself. You can be turning to Romans chapter 8. Oh, I forgot to give you that. While Paul was still in Jerusalem, Acts 23 and 12, when it was day, the Jews made a plot to bound themselves by an oath neither to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Paul experienced a lot of hatred, a lot of hurt. But his encouragement comes from something we already studied, Romans chapter 8. If you'll turn to that, Romans chapter 8. Paul says, we have got to be well aware that pain and suffering and persecution and disappointment are going to be very much a reality for Christians. It's very much a part of what is to be expected from being included in the family of God. Let's read what he says about it. Romans 8 and verse 35. Romans 8 and verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Can tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword? Can any of these things separate us from the love of Christ? That's kind of archaic language. What he's saying is, do any of these things, when we suffer any of these things, does that mean God doesn't love me? Because that's what we struggle with, isn't it? When we go through difficulty, when we embrace our new faith, when we're going through life and things work out really, really bad for us, isn't that the first place we go? Is Why me, God? Why? Anytime something hurts, we always want to know why. I don't like this. This isn't 
the expectation that I had for my life. Why, why is it like this? Why do I have to go through this? That's where we always go. Paul is going to tell us all throughout Romans chapter 8, this might be a good read for us, all throughout the chapter he's going to say, hey, you have to understand that difficulties is a part of life. And no matter what your particular difficulty is, it does not mean God has been separated from you. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean God isn't aware. But there are things that we will just have to go through in life. Let's look at the list that he gave there. The first three things, tribulation, distress, persecution. All of these relate to your religious faith, a religious persecution, things that happen to you because of the faith that you have in your God. Tribulation, distress, <coughs> and persecution. They're all a part of the package. The second list, four words, famine, nakedness, danger, and sword. All of those things have to do with complete upheavals in your nation. Famine was caused by wars, <laughs> uh, plagues, uh, the, the, bare, the bare shelves. We've all been through that. Oh, no, the shelves at Walmart are all bare. What does that mean? <clears throat> We've all had our own little scare in the last year. But none of this stuff, none of what goes on during a chaotic time of the nation, whether it's an invasion by an enemy, the swords, the famine, <clears throat> danger, danger is lurking everywhere. He says none of that means <clears throat> that God doesn't care. Going through that does not mean God doesn't love you. It's a part of the package. These things are always destined to happen. On the contrary, rather than meaning that God doesn't care, on the contrary, what it does mean is that you have been brought into the family of God. If you think about it, he's going to tell us in just a moment that we've been adopted as children of God. Paul says when you're suffering... When you have difficulties because of your faith with your family members, with your parents, your siblings, your children, the world that you live in, when it's difficult because of your faith, he says that should be a reminder to you that you've been adopted into the family of God. What does that look like? Well, think about who God's children have been. God's children were all the Old Testament prophets that went into the world to proclaim the word of God. How were they treated? persecuted, chased, and killed. Look at the 12 apostles, all children of God. How were they treated? Persecuted, chased, and killed. Jesus, the Son of God, how was He treated? Persecuted, chased, and killed. So when you, the text tells us, when you're suffering because of your faith, that should be a wake-up call to rejoice because that means I am just like all the other children of God, persecuted, chased, and killed. I'm just like all of the other family members of God. That's what we are should be reminded of. Uh, Dunn, Dunn is a uh, scholar that writes on the Greek uh, exegetical commentary on the book of Romans. And he makes this comment here, the point being that such sufferings as are about to be listed in that passage which we just read, they should be seen as evidence of our union with the crucified one. Our suffering is to remind us that we are participating in Jesus' life. It shouldn't be a cause for doubting God's love. That's a powerful phrase for us. If you suffer for Christ, then it's evident that you have become part of the Christian family. Romans chapter 8, we'll stay here for just a little bit. Romans chapter 8 says that we've been adopted into the family of God. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Let's, I want to say the same thing that I just said. A slightly different way. Think about 
uh, any child that gets adopted into a family. When you get adopted into someone's family, irregardless of your past and your history, all of a sudden when you step foot in that home, you are going to experience a brand new reality. If you get adopted by someone that's wealthy, someone that has power, you might find in that family that your first car is a BMW 300 series. Luck of the draw, right? All of a sudden you get to wear fancy name brand clothes. All of a sudden you get to go to the best private schools. All of a sudden you get a great fancy new car just because you were adopted into that family. And however, it's possible to get adopted into a family of meager means. And that means a new reality. You may get adopted into a family where you have to wear secondhand shoes. You don't get to have brand new shoes. Secondhand clothes, you don't get to wear brand new fancy clothes. And maybe you're adopted into a family that a lot of people don't like, so you didn't do anything to deserve it, but all of a sudden a lot of people don't like you very much because you're part of that family. So adoption brings with it a brand new environment, a brand new reality for everybody. Paul speaks about adoption in Romans chapter 8. Let's look at verse 15. Paul tells us it's the same for us. We've been adopted into God's family and we just have to understand what do the children of God experience while they live this life on earth. Verse 15, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Verse 17, And if you are children, then you are also heirs. That means you inherit whatever comes with that family relationship. You have inherited those things. You are heirs of God, fellow heirs with Jesus, provided... I want you to put a, 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 a square around these words in verse 17. Provided we suffer with him. There's a condition. The brothers and sisters that, of the family that we've been adopted into have all experienced suffering and persecution. That's the family that you've been adopted into because of our faith. So if you really want to be a member of this family, if you really want to be an heir of the family, you have to be willing to undergo the same type of suffering that the rest of the family, the prophets, the apostles, and Jesus underwent, because that's the family you've been adopted into. So if we are willing to suffer with Him, we will also, and then put a square around this, be glorified with Him. To be glorified with Christ means during His time on this earth, Scripture says He was despised. Scripture says, Isaiah 53, He was like somebody from whom men hid their face. It says that so much went wrong for Jesus that it looked like God was angry with Him from the outside. But after he finished his walk in this life, the physical realm, he was resurrected to the spiritual realm where everything is different now. Everything is different because now Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God. All rule and authority has been given to Jesus now. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he comes back, everyone that was responsible for persecuting him, every knee will bow 
and every tongue will confess you are God. You are the Savior. You are the King. That is the glory that comes after this earthly life that we have to go through that is not going to be easy because of the family that we've been adopted into. But he says, if you will live this life the same way Christ lived his life in the flesh, then after this life, your exaltation comes. Your glorification comes. Every tear will be wiped away. Every illness will be gone. Every person that persecuted you will be kneeling. And they'll be judged by you. This idea of suffering with him, being glorified with him. Do you remember the little Greek words that we learned at the beginning? S-U-N, soon. When soon is put in front of a word, it means that you do it together with somebody. This marks three of these that Paul has given us. In this text, soon pasho, pasho is to suffer. But Paul puts soon in front of it, which means to suffer with Jesus. The next word dogza means glory, but Paul puts soon in front of it, which means we will also be glorified with Jesus, together with Jesus and he used soon pao'o. Uh, pao'o means to rest, to sleep, to take a break. And Paul says, my expectation, he puts soon in front of it together. I hope that we can rest and finally take a break together. Uh, those words are pretty interesting to me. And lastly, let's look at what Jesus talked about this earthly period of time that we have in this world, this very short period of time that we have here on the earth before we're glorified. Luke chapter 6 and verse 20. Jesus taught his disciples. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6 and verse 20. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, because then you'll be satisfied. Blessed are you who cry now, because there you will laugh. Verse 22, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you, when they spur your name. For Jesus' sake, rejoice when that happens. Leap for joy. For behold, your reward will be great in heaven. That's our lesson in Romans, finishing out chapter 15, when reality doesn't match our expectations. Remember this text, two things. Never doubt that your difficulty means God doesn't love you. Never doubt that difficulty means He isn't concerned and aware but rather remind yourself that the difficulty that I face in this life because of my Christianity reminds me of whose family I've been adopted into. I've been adopted into a family that is hated by the world because this family is the light of the world, but the darkness hates the light. John chapter 3, light came into the world. What a glorious, beautiful thing. John 3 and verse 19, but the world loves darkness and the world loves sin. So if you've been adopted into a family that is always carrying the torch, always bearing the light, then people that love darkness are always going to feel animosity towards you. That's the family that you've been adopted into. But even though we go through whatever it is we go through here on earth, great is your reward in heaven when you get glorified. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this text that we've been able to reflect on Paul's life. What an amazing Faith and power you bestowed on Paul, Father, to endure the impossible. But what 
mercy you've shown to reveal to your children that we are destined for some of the same things should we choose to be a light in this world. Father, thank you for the encouragement that it doesn't mean that it separated us from you. It doesn't mean that we aren't loved, but rather it means it, it, it validates, it testifies to the fact that you have brought us into your household, that we have now become light and that these types of treatments is to be expected whenever light lives amongst the darkness. Father, sustain your children during this walk in our life. Give us your Holy Spirit, Father. Give us confidence and uh, help us to shine that light and to look forward to the reward that comes in the next life, not this one. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen.